So I want to now uh, welcome Ron Paul to the stage. Um, he's here with his wife, Carol. So let's, let's give it up for Ron Paul. So glad to see so many people here. <laughs> Sounds exciting. Sounds like we have something really going right now. <laughs> but before I get started, I do want to uh, certainly recognize Justin Amash for that. Very nice introduction. And he makes it so much less lonely in Washington <laughs> these days. <laughs> Um, and, and Justin, you know, has been, been there just the first term, but it, it uh, you know, followed up from, I met him about four years ago. So the, the country is changing, the Congress is changing, but we have a lot more to do. What I say quite frequently, the people are way ahead of the Congress. Congress is still asleep, and that is our job to wake up Congress and the entire Washington. But also, it's a pleasure to be in the hometown of my brother, uh, Dave Paul. He's a minister here in Hudsonville, and he's with me today. He, um, he has some of his grandchildren. I have one of my grandchildren here, Lisa, Linda, is with me today. This is Linda. But then... Then uh, I brought my wife along, and I think a few of you have met my wife, Carol. <laughs> but it is, it is so nice to see such a nice crowd. Um, in Washington, I would on occasion give speeches on the House floor, but I never got applause, so that's why I like to give speeches outside Washington. <laughs> it's, it's much more fun. <laughs> But, uh, like I said, uh, the country is much further ahead, and I think it's been true for a long time. The people are way ahead of the Congress. I figure Congress is about 20 years behind, but what we need to do is turn the clock up, speed it up a little bit. We need changes quicker now than ever before. For years, for years, I used to say, and a lot of people still say it, and it's, there's some truth to it, and that is that we can't speak, keep spending this money and borrowing the money or we're going to pass this debt on to our children. But I don't say, I don't say that as much anymore because I think this, the next generation that was going to get this debt passed on to, I think we are that generation that inherited the problems of the last 40 years, and that's why we have to deal with our problems right now. If I were to uh, simplify our problems, I would say that we've gotten to this mess because we have sent too many people to Washington uh, that have not taken their oath of office seriously and uh, have not uh, done what they should have. I think the people have been lax. They, they keep getting them reelected. So it's not all just the Congress and just the president. The people have been uh, lax as well. But w we need to you know, change this by changing the people's attitude about what the government should be doing. And let me tell you, the government under our Constitution is not supposed to be running a welfare state nor a warfare state. It's there to protect our liberties. That's what the job is. I think most people recognize the crisis now mainly for economic reasons. Four or five years ago, you know, the bubble burst. A few of us talked about that over the years, especially the Austrian free market economists. They have been right on their predictions, and they have predicted that this would come, and it did come. But uh, now uh, most of the people realize, not only in this country, but around the world, this is not a U.S. problem, because we're living with a problem that has been developed differently than ever before. 
because we have been the issuer of a fiat currency called the dollar. And the dollar has been used as a reserve currency as if it were gold. And therefore, the inflationary problems of the world and all the distortions and all the debt crisis is worldwide. And therefore, we're facing this a, a crisis bigger than ever. So the recognition is there. And this is, this is not all that bad because it's when people live with their head in the sand that we keep doing the same thing over and over again. And right now, people are waking up and saying, you can't solve the problem of too much spending and too much borrowing and too much debt and too much printing press money by merely doing the same thing over and over again. So that's why I'm optimistic that the people know now that we can't continue on the same course that we have been doing for at least the last 40 to 50 years. The, the economy is obviously the big issue, and certainly in a state like Michigan, that is the big issue, and uh, it has to be addressed. Some states do better than other states. There are some states in the south that do better than the states in the north, and, 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 and it's not all accident. The federal government does a lousy job providing the environment necessary to be competitive and to uh, be able to compete in, throughout the world because they overtax, they overregulate, and they distort the economy with the inflation, distort the interest rates. So the federal government has a lot of responsibility. In particular, there's one group of people that we should deal with, and I'll talk more about that, and that is that group that's located over in the Federal Reserve Building that we have to deal with. you want to talk about the Federal Reserve System. Uh, you know, it's been there, it's been around for 99 years, and they've literally destroyed 99% of the dollar they inherited in 1913. So they're doing a wonderful job, and one of their mandates is to... One of their mandates is a stable dollar and stable prices. I don't think they've done a very good job. The other mandate they have is, uh, is low unemployment, and they haven't done a very good job there either. But, but the, the problems that the Federal Reserve, uh, the Federal Reserve and uh, the federal government with the mandates and the regulations and all that, that's a big thing. But some states suffer more because some states put a greater burden because you have local regulations. And I think the issue mentioned in the introduction is a big issue, and that is the uh, cost of labor. The cost of labor should be competitive. People should be able to, uh, you know, negotiate. It, and the contract is what's supposed to uh, deal, uh, decide how workers come together and business people come together. There should be no laws prohibiting the uh, organization of labor. Labor should have a right to organize and talk. And then they have a right to negotiate with business, and business and labor should come together. This is the way a market would work. Who knows, in a totally free market, you might have competitive unions, for all that we know, to try to compete for the best job and provide the best, uh, best workers. But it's when, it's in 1935, when they didn't understand the Depression, they, they claimed the Depression came about because of free markets, capitalism, and the gold standard. So therefore, what did they do? They destroyed the gold standard and brought up a lot more regulations and destroyed the free market and gave us this intervention Keynesianism, which we've been living with uh, for a long, long time. But uh, in, in 1935, they gave us the National Labor Relations Act, and uh, this, this uh, distorted the balance. It didn't deal with, uh, you know, the right to organize and the right to contract. It said, if you want to get together and organize, you have special power. So when they talk about getting workers' rights back, I think they're misleading because they're not rights to get a clout from the government. Now, big business gets clouts, too, and that's wrong, but big labor is not supposed to get better, bigger power.
dollars. Now the compensation had, that has a concern over the years have states have gone and tried to get around this by having right to work laws and try to compensate for the special powers uh, that have been granted to, to, to the unions. So this, is, uh, this distorts the market and the states that have not compensated, they have suffered the very most. And therefore it can't, uh, it, it has to be uh, addressed. Now I support a national uh, right to work law. And some of the other candidates do not support that law, even though they are conservative Republicans. <laughs> but it's in, the first question that should come if somebody wants to challenge you says, well, how can you support a national law? You don't believe in these national laws. What's going on? Well, actually, it isn't a new law, new process. It's to cancel out that special authority. It's to remove a special power and cloud that was given in the 1935s. So that would be a big help for a state like this if, if the economy, if you want to get the economy moving again. I just think of the companies that got into trouble in this, in this breakdown uh, just four or five years ago, the auto companies that got into trouble, there were a lot of auto, auto companies that were in the South run by other companies, and they didn't have the same problem. So uh, to put our head in the sand and say that uh, this has to happen uh, and, and persist, but even the bailouts of the company, it, it wasn't, once again, governments are supposed to be there to guarantee con contracts, protect contracts, enforce contracts. So what did the government do come in when they bailed out? They took money from people they shouldn't have taken money to and then given the money and the bailout and protected individuals that didn't deserve the protection. So the government should be restrained to protecting contract, protecting the marketplace, protecting private property, and they ought to reduce the amount of regulations and they ought to give us a sound currency. That's what would help our economy today. The other major problem we have faced these last five years is the inability of politicians to allow the correction to occur. Corrections, when mistakes are made, you're supposed to have a correction. But nobody wants to, uh, you know, go through the correction. So they say, well, what we have to do is bail out companies and the various things uh, because the correction is the way they say too painful. If you don't have the bailouts, there's going to be a depression. And there was some truth to that. The people who had overextended, who, who uh, especially in the housing bubble, abused it, got into the derivatives market, and they were gambling with all these, these derivatives. Yes, they were in big trouble, and the banks owned them, and, and all the insurance companies and the banks were very much involved. So they said, there's going to be a crisis. It's going to be major. They're too big to fail. Well, the truth, the truth is, the free market tries to correct the problems of government. They should have failed. They're the ones who should have failed, not... <laughs> But instead, what happened is the, the Congress, as well as the Federal Reserve, went and bought, bought up all the bad debt. They didn't liquidate the debt. If you or I get into trouble and we're in our heads, over our heads with debt, and we want to have our own economic growth again, we have to get our debt out of the way so that we don't have to keep paying interest and accumulating more and more debt, or eventually we can't borrow any more money. A country has to do that too. The debt has to be liquidated. But when they bailed out these countries, the debt was propped up. Japan did the same thing 20 years ago, and they're still in trouble. So what happened to the debt? Did the companies who held the debt and made all the money, uh, are they stuck with it? No, it's on our shoulders, it's on the middle class America, and that's why middle class America is suffering. And the very people the bleeding hearts wanted to help and give a free house to, guess what? They're the ones who lost their jobs and lost their houses, and they're suffering the consequence of the inflation now. So government intervention and government planning, whether it's through the Federal Reserve or through Congress, doesn't work. The people have to plan. The people may have to decide how the money is being spent, not the government and not the politicians and not the bureaucrats.